So today, for this week, we'll talk about hydraulic steam system. If you are working in a hydraulic system, chances are if you're working in Chicopee, Holyoke, or the Western Mass, probably you will face a lot of steam heating systems, be they gas or, uh, or oil. So steam is going to be very common and you will have to work with them. It's good to know the components and how does it function. It's a very sophisticated system. It works for your ages. Uh, I have a system in my house that was installed in the 1920s and it's still working. So 100 years later, the system is still working. Probably they did have to change the boiler at some point. I highly doubt that the boiler lasted for 100 years. But the piping has been there for over 100 years. That's very impressive. So it's very well made system. It is more expensive to install than uh, hot water. And what else? Uh, the radiators are very heavy. They are expensive. But again, they last for a long, long time. Uh, leaks are an issue, but not as much as hot water because if there's a leak, it will drip and you have steam, so steam will rise. So if we, uh, leaks are not that devastating when, when they happen. However, they are more common. Why? Because steam has more pressure, and steam is gas, and gas is easier to escape than water. Yeah. For new installs, though, do they still install like, like water systems and things? Because it seems so old school. Uh, they are old school. For new, for new construction, usually they do not do steam. So if they are there, people will. They're more expensive. If you look at the at the mattress, the equipment mattresses, the radiator, the radiator, they're very heavy, and they're very involved, and they're very bulky. So if they are there, nobody will change them. But sometimes you do because you have to re fire the whole system. But for new system, you it's your, you hardly ever find this at all. And there are new technologies that are available now. And by the way, I put a 10 point extra credit essay on Blackboard and their homework. If you want some extra points in this, in this class, 10 points. And uh, it's about going and doing some research and talking about new technologies that has been introduced to the field. There is, uh, I put a few examples, but if you're interested, it's in Blackboard and their homework. Two pages. Uh, there's infrared, there's new radiator, there's uh, also radio floor heating. So if you want, you can uh, get extra 10 points. So, steam system, as Hamilton said, they're not very common for you, but you will have to work with some of these. And they're very common and they're very efficient. Uh, the reason we started with steam system and not hot water is what? They didn't have a pump. They didn't have a pump. Steam is easier to disperse, it's quiet. You don't have to hear the steam moving because it's going to flow from low pressure to high pressure. And usually you'll hear the system also is uh, slow acting, only in the beginning, when you start from room temperature, resistance temperature to reach 220, it takes 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes more than that. But once you start heating, whatever heat you put, it will turn the water into steam, and the steam will disperse, and you have the water come back. Okay. The system is also very sophisticated in terms that it's, you can have only one pipe. That is, okay. You can have one pipe, this pipe will, will carry steam and will also carry water at the same time. So, how did this happen? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that and we'll also look up some of the problems that uh, steam can have. So, the components. Well, this is the first thing we have to think about is the radiator selection. It's called a radiator, it's called a mattress, it's called a uh, convector, but it does the same thing, which converts steam into water. <coughs> steam gives off its heat, the radiator condenses into water and comes back, either from a different pipe or the same pipe. Piping schemes, we either have, <coughs> have one pipe system or two pipes. Why would people use the one pipe system? Cheaper. Cheaper, less involved when you have to install, and uh, you don't want to have a lot of web of uh, big pipes for steam. Steam pipes are usually large, usually more than 
about an inch and a half because you want to allow room for the water to come in and for the steam to draw. So the one pipe system, you'll have a connection with the radiator here, and you have an elbow, and down. And there's always a tilt here. It's always a tilt of 10 degrees, sometimes more. This tilt allows the, the water to drip and the steam to come up on the same pipe. <coughs> So what would you think would be the problem if we, oh, by the way, Casper, we're ready for 12.30 today. 12.30 today. All right. So, the problem is that this uh, size will allow the, the, the steam to come in without interacting with the water. What happens when water meets the steam? Hammering. Mm -hmm. Hammering. And a lot of banging, and it's really annoying. And sometimes with this connection here, <coughs> rust, and this area gets smaller, so you have a lot of banging. So if you have banging in one radiator, you know it's not the entire system, it's only that radiator. So you take it out and you clean the orifice. Or sometimes you might want to check the tilt. The radiator is put in the right place. So I never understood like how, how water is being made to the now. Yeah, that's, that's the hammering. That's the hammering and that's happening because sometimes, if you notice, the radiator is very heavy, right? So it tilts the other way sometimes and it needs some support. If you look at some old radiator, probably see somebody putting some kind of piece of wood or cardboard in the radiator to tilt it towards the pipe. So you want to tilt towards the pipe, not too much, around 10 degrees. What happens if you do it too much? The water level will increase and you'll have steam going one way and water coming the other way. And that's what happens if you have a steam pocket and it will pop and cause a hammering. So if you have hammering, check the tilt. Also check this area that is not corroded or not obstructed, and that's when we have some steam. So if you have banging, you know that's, or hammering, that's when you know that water, too much water is meeting steam, and sometimes also is the steam. So radiator selection. So if you look at your formula sheet, there's a section here which says radiator, under radiator selection, the first one is for steam. There's something called EDR, which is uh, a convergent, 240 feet of, uh, of uh, radiation, EDR. So, why is this different than regular really hot water radiator? If you look at the shapes, those radiators, they come in different shapes and sizes and sizes. <coughs> so it's really difficult sometimes to estimate how much heat you'll give off that shape based on the surface area. Meanwhile, if you look at this radiator for hot water, the area is very concise and it's really easy to predict based on the water temperature and the size. Roughly, we have 59. For, for uh, steam, they'll give you something called EDR which is different than BTU per foot. Because again, the shapes are different. And you want to explain how much this will give you heat in general, and the surface area is big. And again, what are the three modes of uh, heat transfer? Convection. Convection, convection, and radiation. So steam radiators mostly give off heat using natural convection, but also because they're large, they do also radiate. So there's a lot of radiation coming up, and also some convection. So they sum the up for us, something called the EDR, the estimated direct radiation. How much heat you can get out of that radiator based on size and shape. So uh, piping scheme, one pipe or two pipe. Valve requirements, you'll assume that there will be a valve here. And that valve, again, make sure it's completely fully open or fully, fully closed. A lot of the time people want to reduce the heat so they, open, they half open it or half close it. Well, what would happen? You have hammer. These things were designed to be either <coughs> fully open or fully closed, and some of them actually have sign on it. But if you find some hammering, you know that maybe the, pipe, the, the valve is corroded, or maybe it's half open or half closed. So either you cut it off completely, or you turn it on fully. Uh, equipment, what do we need? We've seen a lot of steam boilers here. Low water cutoff, Low water cutoff thank you. High pressure. Cut off, 
that's very, very important. And you will need also in every radiator a vent. And we'll talk about why we need a vent and how does it function. It's very, very interesting design. Uh, again, the, the low water cover is the cutoff is the most important part. Also the high pressure steam. And again, every boiler has pressure related up. In case something fails, you know, heat want to go pressure. So it's not as popular as water system nowadays because water systems are cheaper to install. These things are much cheaper. Uh, did anybody price those radiators? Was the pricing for the project? We're working on it. Okay, so these are sized by foot. So they're not that expensive. Probably you can get them for 15,000 foot or so, but uh, check it based on the, on the company. And uh, they are much cheaper. The, the steam radiators are more expensive and they are sold per section and they have to be pre-ordered based on the size. And again, the size can be a lot of uh, plus and minus. So you'll ask for 4,000 BTUs, you might get something that will give you less or more EDR. <coughs> the, the steam radiators are very thick. If you look at the steel, it's very, very thick. Be able to withstand the heat from the steam. Steam will be at uh, sometimes 250 or 300 degrees Celsius, so it has to withstand the, the heat. Also, it has to withstand the contraction and expansion that going back and forth all the time. That's why they have to be thick, so they will not fatigue. What is fatigue? You know, when you get a piece of metal and you keep on bending it over and over, and eventually it breaks. So you, if you want something that will stand fatigue, it has to be thick enough, and also it has to be soft. So if it's very rigid, it will eventually break. That's why you see most of steam, radiators are made of steel, uh, uh, carbon steel, and not uh, mostly, not stainless steel, something thin. Has to be something with a lot of uh, malleable, bendable material. Uh, you also will see a lot of copper, because it will be very expensive to build the same exact thickness out of copper. Uh, not as popular, problem with leaks, sagging pipes, and vent failures. So this is one of the most, the, some of the common problems is leaks. Over time, the binding agent or the tape around the around the joint here will over over years of heat it will deteriorate and it will start to have some dripping. And I've seen a lot of people who have dripping in all radiators and they used to put a pan underneath it because it's not that much. But over time it will keep dripping. And the only solution is to take out the joint, the coupling. So all the coupling, you can the coupling and change the, the tape. Uh, again, these are subject to a lot of heat. It's a function of time. It will last for at least five years, but you have to change it uh, once, once in a while. Sagging pipes is an issue when you have a long pipe without the proper support. And we talked about that last week when we talked about pipe extension. If you have a very long pipe and it, it's heated, it will sag. It will sag, which means you'll have a lot of water accumulation. I will draw this a little bit. So if you have a long pipe, Support in here, support in here, and uh, as it heats up, of course, sometimes you don't see it as, as clearly. And this is again, this has to be tilted by <coughs> 10 degrees towards the radiator. So the tilt down <coughs> is towards the boiler, so you can collect the water coming in. And you have the water in the bottom and steam in the top. So what happens here, if you have water here, water will accumulate in this area and it will stay there for a long, long time. And whenever you pump in steam, it will run through some water and it will provide some kind of a wave and it will keep hammering. So some of the uh, solutions for that is to provide a support here. Sometimes you have to uh, push it up a little bit. And if the pipe has already been bent completely, you have to change it otherwise the volume here. Uh, required involved piping. Piping is thick, you can do a lot of threading. You can install those pipes and use the proper uh, uh, tape or compound. Uh, boilers are usually larger, but you can get small HV Smith boilers that will provide enough steam. Uh, pressure based movement is the circulator. There's no circulator in most cases, it's always based on pressure steam will rise up, it will condensate and come back to the same pipe. 
sometimes, in some cases, they have a circulator pump to pump back the condensate back to the boiler. So you collect all the condensate in one reservoir and then pump it back to the boiler. Uh, when do we do that? When we have a very large system and the water is getting is too much, so you have to put back the water. For example, look at this building. This building is completely hit by steam. The steam comes from building 17 all the way here in insulated pipes. The water collects in all the vents and drips into a well, and this well has a pump that will pump the water all the way back to building 17. So, is that what the engine does? Yeah. Oh. So this will collect all that condensate and pump it back to the building. So it's a large system, but we cannot depend completely on gravity to feed back the water into the system. So boiler feed water system is a storage tank where all the condensate gather with some make of water to supply boiler with required water. So the water inside the system circulates, it goes round and round. It should be a closed system. Ideally, you're not supposed to lose any system. However, you do lose some steam from some joints, also from the vent. So the vent, when it's empty, what's in it? Air. Air. Because it shouldn't be back. It's air. There's a vent system that allows air in. Once you pump steam, the steam will replace the air, will push out the air, and sometimes you leak out some steam if the vent is failing or it's not very sealed. So the steam will come out and sometimes lose few drops here and there. So over time, you have to have a makeup water where you add some water to the system. And also, it's a good practice that every, every uh, once in a while, you flush the water. And whenever you flush the water, it comes out very dirty and very rusty. Question? If the water is Uh, because again, we lose water every once in a while. You lose water, like uh, depending on how big the system is, you lose uh, water from the, some radiators, some leaks. Ideally, if the system is, is tight and new, you don't lose a lot of water, but you lose some water because it evaporates from some radiators, so you have to make up. Not a lot, probably a gallon once in a while. And also, you need to make up water because you want to drain the system. You want to flush it. There's a lot of accumulation of debris and rust accumulate the boiler, so you always, you always find a drain or a blow down system at the bottom of the boiler, you open it up, and all the dirty water comes up, and you replace it with new water. It's a good idea to flush the system repeatedly, otherwise you'll have some accumulation of uh, rust inside the, the boiler. Uh, so this is the boiler feed water system. You want water coming all the time to flush and also to make the water. Kind set is the collected water from each radiator. Again, we said each radiator is uh, made out of steel. When steam hits cold steel, it will condensate, make drops, and comes back. So you need, this is, it's called the condensate. The riser is a vertical pipe that supplies steam or returns condensate from the heating unit. So this is just a terminology. It's called the riser, and the riser is usually where you supply the steam. And sometimes you, in two pipe system, you supply steam from the top. So this is my. Again, a lot of companies, they sell you radiator per section. I will tell you this is a steam per section. So this is the riser. And it supplies steam. And you'll have a drain here for condensate. That's for a two-five system. For a one-five system, Trap, a device that prevents steam from entering the condensate return line. So the hydraulic trap, where you have, uh, it's gonna be somewhere in here, so you prevent the steam from coming back into the water line. So you want only water coming into the, the steam. And I'll show you a video on how the trap works. It's very interesting technology, where you think about the steam, which is heavier, steam or air? Air is heavier than steam. It's gonna come out and kick out the air. Uh, steam has more pressure, more power, more molecules. So uh, 
Again, steam has more lifting power. So the riser uses lifting power to plug uh, a valve and lift the air out. When steam goes weak, it will drop again. Steam can push things. You can push things with steam. That's why you see a lot of uh, steam cleaners. Turbines too. Huh? Turbines. Yeah, you can push a heavy wheel. You can clean a lot of surfaces with it. It has a lot of pushing power, a lot of uh, energy in it. Besides the heat and melting. So, uh, so that's a trap. It's basically to prevent steam from going into the water. And again, you want to separate water from steam because that will have water hammering. This is a steam trap. This is my client set coming in. Steam going out. And if steam is mixed with water, steam has the power to lift this bucket. The, if, the, if the bucket is lifted, you open this uh, pin and you let the steam go through, but the air will come out from the vent. So the air will be here. If you have air, it will go through. But if you have steam, it will rise up. So air does not have the, the power to lift this bucket. It's called the inverted bucket trap. And you will see a lot of those in, uh, in power plants. We have a lot of steam generation. The, the challenging part about steam and a lot of hydraulic systems is you don't see what's happening. Like uh, if it's all closed system, it's not very visual. So you really have to see. So this is where how it functions. So if you have this is air, if it's air, the bucket will be low. See, now it's air. So whenever you have air, the air is not going to uh, If it's up, then it's steam. It is capable of functioning under very high pressures because the same operating pressure is exerted both inside and outside the bucket. A small orifice called a bucket vent is located at the top of the bucket to ensure that non-condensable gases cannot be trapped inside the bucket. Steam, air, and condensate enter the trap through an inlet tube beneath the bucket. Air and condensate are discharged through an orifice at the top of the trap. At the orifice is a valve that is linked by a lever to the top of the bucket so that the valve is closed when the bucket is in the up position. The body of the trap is a cylinder which contains the bucket. During proper operation, this cylinder is always filled with condensate to a level above the top of the bucket. This condensate provides a constant water seal above and around the bucket, preventing live steam from escaping from under the bucket. Finally, in the cap of the body is a space above the water seal where any non-condensable gases which have passed through the bucket vent will collect while the valve is closed. Incoming steam is trapped between the top of the bucket and the water seal below. When approximately two-thirds of the volume of the bucket is filled with steam, the bucket becomes buoyant and floats to a point where the valve is pushed toward the orifice by the bucket clip extension. The higher condensate velocity near the orifice propels the valve into the seat where it is sealed and held shut by differential pressure. Radiation causes the steam inside the bucket to cool and condense. If the condensed steam is replaced by more steam, the bucket remains buoyant and the valve closed. However, when enough steam has been condensed by radiation and is displaced by entering condensate so that only one third of the bucket volume contains steam, the bucket loses buoyancy. As more steam condenses, the bucket becomes heavy enough to pull the valve off its seat. With the discharge valve open, condensate flows down around the bottom of the bucket and out through the discharge port. Air too rises to the top of the bucket, where it flows through the bucket vent and water seal, accumulating at the top of the trap. When the valve opens, the air is pushed out of the trap ahead of the condensate. Okay, so there are some steam vents here, so probably you'll see this in some there's some steam mattresses. What are these? These numbers have nothing to do with the 
for the temperature. But it has something to do with the temperature. It has nothing to do with how much heat you're going to get in or what does the temperature say. So it's not a thermostat. What it does is it, it balances the rate of which the steam comes in and the air comes out. So you'll see this in a lot of uh, uh, steam models. This is the inverted bucket vent where you have the top of your mattress and this lever will go up and down based on its air. If its air is not going to be able to lift that and you see air venting, then it will stop. Uh, this is a normal close and open valve that you will see for steam. And what is this? Relay valve. So I'll pause this. Most of the time when you uh, how would you know that the steam trap is like bad or broken? Good question. If you have a steam trap on the on the on the mattress, if the mattress is not getting hot, you have steam, and there's no heat coming into the mattress, what do you what does that mean? What do you mean by mattress? It's called a, sorry, sorry, right? It's called a steam mattress. I really is called a mattress. Oh, okay. But it's a big mattress mm -hmm. layer. So if it doesn't go into the radiator, if it's not getting hot, it means that you're not venting air. So you can the vent, and if you see the air coming, you know it's the steam trap is not happening. So it heats up, and uh, sometimes if it heats and it makes a whistling noise, you know it's the bottom of the whistling spray. You just it's supposed to hiss, it's not a lot, and if you keep hissing and leaking steam, you know there's also something wrong with it. And uh, again, uh, what's your, do you expect those sessions to be heated in order closer to the fire? So it's going to heat first, this one, this one, this one. Radiator and this pin, you will balance for the speed where the air will come out. Usually, they tell you in the manual that it should be set at the maximum, and you can reduce them, reduce the rate of how they they come out. So, then where does the vent usually? Is usually the top here. Very sophisticated system. This starts uh, some of the thermostatic valves. So if you look here, this is connected to the radiator, and this is the sensor that senses the heat. And you can move steam in, uh, in and air out. And the thermostatic valves that are placed on the steam radiator or steam mattress. Uh, again, what do you have to check for the radiator? The tilt. How does it tilt? 10 degrees usually to the, towards the, the pipe. If you tilt it more, sometimes you'll have water hammer. If you tilt it less, you can have water hammer. So you have to experiment a little bit. Uh, important number, EDR is 240 BTUs for whatever, for section, for foot, yeah. huh? oh. It's very dark radiation. And uh, BTU hour, this is how much energy we get out of steam. You don't have to know these numbers, it's just, it's good to estimate how much condensate you will have, how much you will condensate steam into water. So 970, uh, one kilo per hour of steam, one per hour steam. Uh, steam. So this is for uh, around a thousand BTU. Is how much pounds of water you'll get from condensate. So each square foot of BTU produces half a quarter of a pound of uh, condensate per hour. Make sense? And why do we need to know that? Uh, Determine whether we need a reservoir or not, and how much water do we expect to come back out of this condensate. And if you have, if you're in the beginning of the season, 
You already had a massive fault, overfill, because there is nothing inside the radiator, there's no steam or water. And once you check the low water cutoff, once the steam is at uh, operating temperature, and it looks like that, then you might have issues with that. So each time the BQ produces around like one pound per hour of condensate, steam temperature increases with pressure. At two PSI, gauge, what is that gauge? What does that gauge mean? That you took out the atmospheric pressure. Steam is at uh, 218 Fahrenheit, and at 15 PSI, steam is at 240. So this is the relationship between steam and, uh, and pressure. So at 218, 220, we have two PSI of steam. And if we go all the way to 15 PSI, which is the maximum for in the boiler for our residential, it's at 240. And by code, we need to keep all the steam inside the system at 2 PSI. Questions? So steam volume, as the pressure increases, the volume will decrease. It will get compressed. The volume at 2 PSI is 23 <coughs> cubic feet at 15 PSI. 13.9 There's a table look up in the, in the book at page 11.9. So that's the relationship between volume and steam. You don't need to know that, just for more information. Again, what is latent heat? To iterate, it's something probably I repeated a lot and Bill repeated a lot. What is latent heat? Unmeasurable. <laughs> Evaporating state. Yeah, it's changing state. So latent heat is the heat you put into the water to turn it into steam. And also latent heat is the heat you're going to emit to transform steam into water. So you cannot measure it, the temperature will, stay, will remain the same, but you're still emitting heat. Steam gives off 970 BTU per pound when it changes to water. So you'll put a lot of Heat into the water to change it to steam. Then you put a lot. You take a lot of heat from the water to change it back into into uh, water. So this is the <laughs> process of what actually happens in a two pipe system. First of all, the radiator is full of air. You pump in steam, and it starts to take over the radiator little by little. The radiator is full of steam and water is completely kicked out, you'll have a lot of it, but it's going to be completely steam. Water will start to accumulate and drips down to the condensate line. This is how it starts to generate the two pipe system. So, near the boiler pipe, there's something called a Hartford loop which is very important, and it's the code now to have in any boiler, especially for steam. The reason it was called Hartford Loop is because it was invented in Hartford, Connecticut. What's in Hartford, Connecticut? A whole bunch of insurance companies. Yes, and they were tired and sick of paying for failed boilers, so a lawyer realized that all those boilers are failing because they have low water, and the only way to do that, he thought of this idea to keep the water level in the boiler at the same level as the water in the condensate line. So if you look at this, this is the boiler. Return to the boiler here. So sometimes at some point, uh, it's kind of the side effect that you have in your, in your toilet. Sometimes you have a lot of much of steam and you push the water out, so the water in the the boiler will, will decrease than it's supposed to. If you have a disconnect to your condensate line, if this pushes back, it will come back to the right level because this is the minimum level for the water in the tank. So the half loop is something that you want to have in your condensate line. So if your water heat decreases, it will eventually rise up to the same level as this one. So if you look also at your any kind of uh, siphoning effect, This is for 
pool of water. So the water here, based on the law of gravity and pressure, the water here will always be at this level. It's gonna go over the tip, uh, the top and come back. So what happens if you, in your toilet, if you dump a bucket of water too slowly? The water will be pushed around, but it will come back to the same level. If you dump it like slowly. What if you dump it too much? What did you do? The amount of pressure will push all the water out and you will empty this bottle, this uh, but physically speaking, if this is full of water, this should be here at the same level as your toilet bowl or at whatever level you want it to be. Uh, this, so this effect that you, that's why you always have some water in your toilet bowl because there's a loop behind it. If you don't have that loop, it will empty and every time you flush, you flush it and it's not going to have any water in it. So the same thing you will have for your boiler. You want the boiler to be at the same level, so that's why you have to have to do water out of it. So I think one of the questions are in the quiz six is what is half the loop and what does it do? So it's a loop done to maintain the amount of water inside the boiler. Controls, you need to have a low water cutoff and cut in pressure, cut out pressure differential. So when do I start the pressure and when do I uh, stop the pressure? Uh, we want to keep the pressure as low as 2.2, 0.5 psi and maximum is 2 psi of pressure inside the, inside the, the boiler. Okay, um, I will stop here and I will finish this on Monday. Uh,